Hi, I'm John Byrne with Poets and Quants. I have with me HBSGuru.com founder, Sandy Kreisberg. We are going to talk about the 2 plus 2 interview game. So on April 30th, uh, the invites went out for the interviews. Everyone's agog about what, what's going to happen, what people are going to ask. So we want to go straight to the source. The guy who reads the tea leaves at the Harvard Business School better than anybody else in the world. Sandy Kreisberg, what's the what's, question? What's the, what's the first question? Yeah, John, tell us. Yeah, that. what's a question that, that's not going to show up in a regular MBA interview that's likely to show up in the 2 plus 2 interview? Okay, this is real important. If you've got a 2 plus 2 interview coming up, you have to be able to answer this question. What risks will being admitted to the 2 plus 2 program allow you to take? Let's break that down. If you get admitted to the two plus two program, that means you can do anything for two or three years. You can do anything for the next two or three years and you will have that admission waiting for you. So they often say, well, wh what are you gonna do in those two or three years? This is a question they never ask the full-time people. So what do you think a good answer for that is, John? Particularly- I'm going to McKinsey because I wanna study a lot of different situations. I want to learn from incredibly bright people and, uh, and prepare in the best possible way for my MBA experience. That's a risk? <laughs> it is a risk if you're me. <laughs> be, be you're, real. What you're looking for is like, I want to go and teach for America for two years. No, it, people who are being interviewed for two plus two in the next week or so, my guess is their plans for the next two years are set. They're graduating college, they know what they're doing in the next two years. What you have to answer is, well, for the next two years, I'll be at McKinsey, that is not much of a risk, I admit, but it will give me the freedom if at the end of one year, if I think I've optimized my McKinsey experience, I could spend the next year doing something entrepreneurial or something unusual. It mm. also might give me the freedom to be a little more, to push back more at McKinsey. Since I, you know, I know I'm getting into Harvard Business School, I, I don't have to, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> adopt my conduct as if I need great recommendations. So in that way, it's like a gift. And I'm very, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you offer this. It's an amazing opportunity to have a guarantee and to kind of cut loose a little bit, even at McKinsey. That's great advice. Yeah, and that's a question they do often ask. Now, what other things should uh, two plus two applicants who've been invited to interview know? They should know the same thing that I tell people about the regular interviews. Do no harm. This is the two plus two interview is a way that Harvard filters. They interview X people and they accept Y. Do you know what those, do you know what, what the relationship of X to Y is, John? No, I don't know the number off, off the top of my head. What, is, what, are, the, what are the numbers? They admit 50% of the people that they interview for two plus, this is yeah. HBS. Even, plus, even for two plus two? Even for two plus two. D is on record on that. You can go to the mm. HBS website. Should we accept about half of the people we interview. D is D Leopold. She runs the two plus two program. And what they're doing is everyone they interview is admissible. They are looking to eliminate people. And how do they eliminate? What are the reasons? How do you flunk a two plus two interview? I imagine you don't come across as genuine. You're not very articulate. You have no professional presence. You wander around and detour from uh, di clear, direct answers. Okay, that, that gets rid of 15% of the people. How do they, you're, that gets rid you of the bottom. You act too arrogant. You're, you're too arrogant. That's rare. Mm. So give us the scoop. Scripted. That is the uh, word you have to keep in mind. You sound scripted. I, I actually have done two plus two 
interview prep, the people were interviewed, they were, re follow this, they were interviewed, they were rejected, and then they spoke to Harvard admissions offices about why they screwed up the interview. Do you want to know what the, those admissions officers said? Sure, they sounded rehearsed. They, they said it wasn't, you didn't sound like you were in real time. You, you mm. were over polished, you were scripted, uh, you, were, you were too dominant. We expected more of a dance. So I don't know how helpful that is, but you should go in there and don't go in there thinking you're gonna show off. Don't have some dream that you're gonna mow them down with your great answers. Just don't say anything. Don't talk for a long time either, by the way. Don't give any pre-recorded jag. Uh, so I realize that that count that covers a lot of ways you could go wrong. But scripted is their catch-all term. Scripted means you weren't authentic, you weren't in the moment, your answers weren't genuine. Uh, the, you, the way you sounded was a little robotic. Uh, it's their catch-all description for goofing it up. But Sandy, here's here's the inevitable problem with that. A lot of people who come off as rehearsed are simply nervous. And so they're not really scripted. What they are is rigid and tight. Uh, they're not comfortable in their own skin because they know there are big stakes here. And so they come yeah. off that way when they're really not that way. How do you beat that? That's an excellent question. That, that, by the way, for their mind, people who can't get over nervousness are people who what, John? who probably can't cut it. <laughs> Correct, or people they don't want in their class. Yeah. That's right. You see, they view, they view the case method as being nerve wracking. What, what they're, what one of the things they're secretly looking for is when this person gets, when they say Ms. Jones or Mr. Smith, could you tell us what happened in the ACME case? You're not gonna get a case of the giggles. So they, so they view this as a kind of shock test of that. Okay, so that's from their point of view. How do you overcome being nervous? Practice, practice, practice. Well, I'd, I'd practice, <laughs> yeah, I'd practice. I'd, I'd be prepared, I'd practice. Uh, Dee Leopold says that there's no preparation you can do. She says that on their website. As, as viewers of the John and Sandy show know, John and Sandy love Dee Leopold. But <laughs> we do. D was not giving you good advice there. You can <laughs> prepare and you can practice. And believe me, if D Leopold's, you know, cousin or niece said, and D, I've got a two plus two interview, what should I do? She would say, practice, okay? Okay. What I want to do fact, now, she'd say, come on over and I'm going to help you. Practice. Yeah, right. But you, you get the idea. So, uh, so what are the most, most likely two plus two questions? How do, what's the arc of the interview and how does it sort of fall together? There's frequently a part where they, they're trying to be nice and they ask icebreaker questions, which are actually pretty difficult. They say, how was... How, 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 how is your year? What, what are you doing this summer? Okay, these are just open-ended questions. How was your year? What are you doing this summer? Uh, do you have trouble getting here? Did you get a chance to see much of Cambridge? Okay, that, that's the phase one. Then they'll say, okay, let's tell me about college choice and college experience is a, mo is a real module. Okay, these are the frequently the college choice questions. How did you choose X college? Why did you go to X college? What was different about X college when you arrived there that you hadn't expected? What is your Okay, so, so if I tell you I, I'm going to a school, be, I went to a school because uh, they had an incredible department uh, in a discipline that I was keenly passionate about, number one. Number two, the moment I stepped on campus, I felt at home, I felt totally comfortable. And when I met students and I attended some of the sample classes, uh, it felt like I really belonged there. 
Is that good? Good. Yeah, that's a good answer. You, you do three kind of things. A, a good way to start the college answer is I went to high school in a large suburban high school. I was looking for a small liberal arts college. Uh, you know, the Northeast was an area I focused on. So I went to this classy Northeast liberal arts college because it was small. It, it focused on liberal arts. That was my thinking. And then I actually spoke to people. I visited. I spent a night there with uh, a guy from my high school who, you know, was a year ahead of me. And everything just clicked. That's a good answer. It, it's wide ranging, it's intelligent, it's convincing. You're not laying it on too, too much. And then they'll say, well, what, what, uh, what was your favorite course? So what's a good answer? Let's, let's see how good you are, John. What's a good answer for that? My favorite co course was calculus because I, there are real answers that how you come, can how come you on. Got a, how come you got a B minus? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got a C, no. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter what the course is, right? You just got to like, like create the moment and, and be convincing. Let me, let me say something. <laughs> it, it, do, do, this is important, and this is a good trivial example that really conveys meaning. Do no harm. If, if you actually got a C minus in calculus and you were not a math major and you and they said what's your favorite course and you said actually calculus do you think that's a good answer or you think that's a wacky answer no it would be a good answer if I said because I found it especially challenging I'm a natural poet uh, and an English lit major I wanted to challenge myself and really learn a really difficult subject and while I didn't perform as well as I wish I had and didn't get the grade I wish I had, I got to tell you, I learned an awful lot of, from that course and it really helped me develop real discipline in my study habits. <laughs> Obviously, I failed that answer. <laughs> well, that's an acceptable recovery from a dumb answer, quite frankly. <laughs> you, you, what you were doing, you were thinking too hard. Mm. If, if you're an English major, and they said, what was your favorite course? The, the, the answer should be Shakespeare. Milton. Milton. <laughs> well, Shakespeare. It was a great professor. You know, I was an English major, you know, and it turned out, you know, that in high school we had read two or three Shakespeare. You know, we read Hamlet and we read Julius Caesar. Uh, and I, so I got to read the whole course. Each play was great. The teacher was terrific. He had us act out different roles. He showed movies. It was, it, was, it was great. It really exposed me to Shakespeare's works, and, and the professor was great. How you know, you know what's, what, what's really interesting about the answers that you give, Sandy? They're really simple, and they're direct. That's right. I mean, there's, there's no cockamamie story going on here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oftentimes, oftentimes, you even use, like, adjectives that are, that are kind of, you know, for a writer like me, boring. They're like, great or terrific but but that's so good natural point. good but point. it's very natural it's a conversation and right. what, you're, what you're trying to do is show off you you think you're on uh pbs interview shows <laughs> where you know you've got you know they're interviewing david niven and that, that's what's going on in your mind you know? <laughs> so they're probably going to also ask um about your major or what your uh, co-curriculars were in college right they ask a lot of college questions. They say, here's a, here's a very popular question. What would you do over if you had your college career to do again? Hmm. Well, you're, oh, you're asking me. Well, you're, you're a useful foil. <laughs> I would say that I uh, wish I, I took more time to uh, engage in extracurricular activities. I, you know, I, I held leadership position in this and in that, um, but I wish I had done even more. That's a, it's not a good answer. <laughs> so what's a good answer? 
First of all, a good answer is uh, 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 I wish I had spent a year abroad. I wish I had learned. I, I, I wish I had taken French. Uh, I, you know, I took French in high school. I had a kind of uh, marginal uh, fluency, and then I lost it. If I had taken French in college, I could really be fluent, and that would be great. That's yeah. a good answer. I like that. Uh, you see, the, the answers I'm giving are all based on your actual, they grow out of your actual experience. By saying, I wish I'd done more extras, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's like, I, I wish I had studied more. Or, you know, or, or, that's like that famous answer, you know, tell me about your weakness. You know, I work too hard. <laughs> mm. Okay, right. this, that brings us to that question. Very popular question for college kids at this two plus two interview is, what do you think your strengths and weaknesses are? Hmm. Well, that's, uh, to me, that's really hard because obviously the first thing that goes into your head is, do I really want to be that vulnerable and tell them the truth? And if I'm vulnerable, will it actually hurt me? But you can't think that way. You're thinking too much. That's your, your problem is you're a double thinker. <laughs> Why don't you just answer the question and not tell us what your ratiocination is? I guess my biggest strength is, frankly, I'm a very driven person. And I really believe there is nothing beneath me. And so to gain an accomplishment, there's nothing I probably wouldn't do within reason. And, and with the right let integrity you, to get it done. Let me, let me give you an answer here. Saying I'm driven is good. And to answer this question, you go, I've got a number of strengths. Uh, um, I can be very focused on things I'm interested in. I've got another strength. Uh, I'm very good at foreign languages. I was able to, uh, um, you know, I, I, I did well in high school in foreign languages, and I took two more foreign languages in college, and I was able to pick them up very quickly. And I, can, I don't know if that's a strength or a gift or whatever, but that's good. And I, I, I'd like to say that I believe another strength of mine is that I, 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 can, I know how to listen. Uh, friends often come to me when, even in my peer group, friends often come to me when they want to hash something out that's serious. Cindy, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What I mean, if I'm, D, I'm, if I'm D, I probably wouldn't let you in the two plus two program, but I think you're really good. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your, what about weaknesses? You know, see my if you biggest can, weakness. See if you can follow that model. <laughs> My, I have, I probably have uh, two, two major weaknesses. Uh, one is I don't give up. And sometimes you need to know when to cut your losses and just move on because you can spend and waste way too much time. Okay, they, that's an acceptable answer. They might jump in and say, give me an example of that. Right. I can't give you an example right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's deadly. You're, 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 you're doing great, John. You're, you're providing, you're, you're flunking this interview 15 different ways. And that's, it. You're, you're, you're the perfect educational tool, okay? <laughs> Not being able to come up with an example is de 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 deadly. Well, I have a real good example, but, but it doesn't apply for a college undergrad. Uh, it was, it was actually, it was about a project that we had launched last year that actually failed and it failed because I was too driven and I thought my staff had the capacity to pull something off that it really didn't. And so we had to basically back away from it at the last minute, uh, return okay, yeah, a sponsor's blah, money. Blah, blah, blah. That's, that's mm. acceptable. Uh, they, they, what they sometimes do, I've, I've read a lot of two plus two reports. They sometimes get on something and drill down. They, they sometimes would say, let's really ask six follow-up questions. Mm. What was the project? What did you say? What did you do? What did your staff say? How would you do that differently? 
So when you're preparing for your two plus two interview and you get to these questions about what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, it really helps if you can make notes about very illustrative stories. Also, what are your, there's this question, what do you think your three biggest accomplishments are? Very common question. Yeah. Well, I would say probably if I was a college student, I would say getting an A in a difficult, difficult course, uh, landing an internship that I really thought I was a long shot on, but I think I was able to get it because of X, Y, Z. Uh, and see, you know what? Graduating from college in four years, because so many of uh, the people that I know um, are, are taking five, uh, and they're not getting, getting over that, with that answer with sucks. <laughs> the first two are okay. The third one should have been personal. Should have been, mm -hmm. you know, I, I also consider an accomplishment, uh, take, taking care of my grandfather. He's, he's very ill. He lives with us. And I realized that my mother was taking care of him and she, it was taking a lot out of her. So I actually, well, I, my, my older sister gets the credit for this, but she said, you know, we, we should really help mom out here. So between us, between the three of us, we took care of grandpa. Sandy, I think you need to counsel Trump before he meets up with Robert <laughs> Mueller. <laughs> or, or, or Kim Jong. Uh, <laughs> okay. And then, so that's, okay. And that's, and, that, and, and what about your career goals at this point? Is that an area of exploration? You should be able to answer that. You know, like, what, what, what are your goals? And there, one goal could be very specific, you know. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very interested in finance. You know, and I, I, some of, this is a good way to answer those questions about goals. Have a hero. Mm. Say, a role model for me in finance is uh, Ro Robert Rubin, you know, you know, just, okay, let's stop the clock here. Did you read Rubin's op-ed in the New York Times two days ago? No, no I didn't actually. Okay, good. Robert Rubin, tell, why, don't you tell, why don't you tell our listeners who Robert Rubin is? Uh, former Treasury Secretary. <laughs> right, and before that? Um, I, he was a, uh, he was in a major bank. Yeah, he was, he was a Goldman superstar. After Goldman, he was part of the bailout team. And then he became treasury secretary. Right. So he's a great role model. So if, if you're interested in finance and you want to signal to them that you're just not a money grubbing guy, like most investment bankers and private equity people have a role model like Robert Rubin. You know, I'm really impressed with the career of Robert Rubin, you know, who was a star at Goldman Sachs and then transitioned into government service and then became a very uh, well thought of treasury secretary. And, and I think now he's involved in some philanthropy. And he, and he wrote a very powerful op-ed in the Times two days ago about this is such great, this is such great HBS music. He, he wrote an op-ed in the Times talking about what the most important courses were to him in college. And what do you think he said? This is triple think on your part, John. Philosophy, Robert, English, history. Philosophy, philosophy, because it taught him how to think. Mm. Okay. You know, he took economics, he took microeconomics, the most valuable course 30 years later, 40 years later, were these philosophy courses, because those courses taught him how to think. HBS likes that, even though they don't like it so much as to suggest you do not apply to their school and get <laughs> a master's in philosophy. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's mix this up with some of their, here's a, here's a two plus two question that could stun you, particularly if it's the first question. In 60 seconds, sell me on your college. 
Really? That's a question that they, that they Wow. Have. Well, I would say it was a medium-sized school. Everyone was incredibly friendly. It was located in part of the country that I'd never visited before and I really wanted to experience. And frankly, the discipline that I was interested in, it's one of the top schools in the world. And when I went there and I actually experienced it, it absolutely proved to be so. Professors were engaging, they were accessible, uh, the students were friendly. Okay, and because it was a medium-sized place. Okay. Who, should go, who should go to your college and who shouldn't? Who is successful at your college and who often are not successful or don't like it or transfer out? I mean, I think the most successful people are people who are really friendly and they want to get to know others. Uh, and they're, they're, they're not comfortable in cliques or in little groups that go that's, off on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's acceptable. It's a tough question. Uh, yeah, I think an answer is that college is very social. Uh, the people who are successful are very social. If, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you didn't have a lot of friends in high school, you might not work out so well. The, the, two, the, the two people, I, I, I knew two people in my first year who transferred or dropped out, and I got to know them a little bit. And in one case, the person was just shy and very smart. I got to know him because he was on my floor in the dorm, but he didn't have a good experience. The other case, the person just wasn't ready for college. He should have taken a year off. And he, he realized that. Mm. So, having real examples is a good way to answer these questions. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to get... Um, some of these hyper-specific questions that they do do in two plus two. And, and I'll post some of these later uh, when we post this, I'll post it in the comments. Great. What book are you reading? That's a very common two plus two question. What book are you reading? Well, obviously I'm reading James Comey's uh, memoir and his observations about um, the FBI. That's a perfect answer. How much cross-examination could you survive? Oh, a good amount. Okay. You so, know, one, so of, one of the things that I, I'll tell you, one of the things I really identified with, now I'm making this up. That's okay. Believe okay. me. Was when he was in school and he really felt pick, picked on. He was, uh, he was an object of um, bullies. Uh, bullies really picked on him, and, 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 and this is before he became tall and gawky, but um, it was an important experience. And actually, the most vi amazing experience that he had that he relayed is why he became an FBI agent, which is uh, he okay, was helping. Okay. We got it. The, the moral of the story is if they say have, what another, have, a, have something to go with, have, a, have an answer and read the book. <laughs> Okay, so homework for you people facing a two plus two answer. If you haven't read a book, read one. Almost any or read, book. Is, or read the excerpt somewhere. Or read somewhere. a lot of reviews, yeah, or <laughs> get up to speed on a book, right. Okay. Fill me on a place to visit. Really? Fill That's a real question? question. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to know the motivation that. behind a question like that. They want to see whether you can uh, respond off the cuff. Hmm. Well, I love Tuscany in Italy. Part Great. of it is, is my own roots. I grew up with my Italian grandfather and grandmother. Uh, going there somehow uh, makes my early childhood resonant because of that experience. Yeah. Why should I, I go I, there? Because you got to love pasta because there's no one in the world who doesn't love pasta. And you get the best pasta, the best wine in Tuscany. All right, that's an acceptable answer. <laughs> uh, okay, let me mention this. Uh, the two plus two interviews are frequently done on campus. And that means you may, there are a number of HBS, a small number of HBS interviewers who ask oddball questions. A famous one is this one. This question will be asked of 
of the two plus two interview cohort. Tell me something, pay attention. Tell me something you want to stop doing. Tell me something you want to keep doing and tell me something you want to start doing. Stop doing, keep doing, start doing. A very famous question by a uh, outlier HPS ADCOM member. Really? Yes. I, I want to stop biting my nails. I want to uh, keep uh, going to the health club to keep in shape. And one thing I would like to start to do, I would like to actually fall in love with someone. <laughs> You're speechless. <laughs> I'm pretending to be the college student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's acceptable. They might. Yeah, they, they, that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that. That's, that's a good answer. Another one of these gotcha questions that are quite frequent. What is something about you that is not in your application? Oh, my uh, incredible, profound love and passion for music. I can't get through a single day without listening to a composition by a famous jazz artist. Um, it's just not possible. Okay, that's acceptable. Another one of their famous tickler questions is, tell me a question you thought I would ask, but I didn't. Why I chose uh, the internship I did between my junior and senior year. Good answer. And then they say, well, then answer it. Okay. Well, it was the only company that would accept me. <laughs> okay, and I just want to get these <laughs> questions out there. Uh, you know, we're having a lot of fun. We're two old geezers here having a lot of fun <laughs> for college kids who are facing this, and it's an important event. It really you know, is. They're, they're not laughing, or they're, they're laughing, but they're getting nervous. They're sweating and laughing at the same time. Uh, what, what do you do in your free time besides read? I listen to music. I run outside. Um, I visit my grandparents. <laughs> good. Okay, those are good. Okay, now I want to shift over to the second module besides college and life experience that frequently happens at the two plus two interview. It's resume based. There's a part there where they say, walk me through your resume. Mm. There's a part there where they say, let's talk about this internship. Why did you take that internship? What did you, this is important. This comes up directly or sideways. Why did you take that internship? What, what did you do there? What was the culture like? What was unexpected? This is a question they often ask. Did you, for real, did you get reviewed at that internship? What did they say at the end of the summer? Would you go back there and why? So you have to, if you're the applicant, what you have to do is go through your resume and have little module answers for college, which we've just done, you know, your background, which we've just done. And for every work experience, you've got to be able to say what you did there, why you took that job, what was good about it, what was bad about it, what the culture was, what feedback did you get? That's a question they often ask. Did you get feedback? What feedback did you get? Sometimes there's a very annoying question, which is tell me about feedback that you've received either at work or from a professor or even on a paper that you disagreed with. And then they'll say, what, what did you do about it? Hmm. Okay. What I want to do is uh, 
actually go through, I just want to read this off so people listening to this tape get an overview of a whole interview. This is a report from someone who was two plus two, who was interviewed at HPS. And this was how the actual interview went. Okay, the first question was, pitch me on your college. The second question was, what are your passions? The third question was, how did your major in college help you pursue those passions? The fourth question was, what was your most memorable moment in college? Your favorite class? Okay, so that was the college module. Then the interviewer said, uh, you know, I, I noticed that you were on the X and Y team. What would your teammates say about you? And what would the coach say about you? And what is the best advice you ever got from your coach? Okay, and then this, this applicant had two internships and the questions were, tell me about the two internships you did. Did you like one better than the other? Uh, and then um, what are you working on now? And um, then they switched. That, so they did, that was the internship module. And then they finished up the interview with a kind of forward looking module. What are you most looking forward to about an MBA? What are you most apprehensive about? the MBA program. And then my favorite question here, John, who do you want to sit next to? You know the Sandy Kreisberg answer to that. Which is D. Leopold. No. <laughs> who do you want to sit next to? A really bright what, what, person who could be what, what, uh, a good friend and, uh, and coach to me. That's a good answer. Usually, what do you think the, the, the banal trite default answer is? I don't know. Six out of 10 people say, I want to sit next to someone totally different than me. Oh, mm. well, that makes sense, actually. That makes sense. Some, yeah. Yeah. You know, you're going to meet people totally different from you in the course of the experience. Anyway, that's the default. You want to you know the Sandy Kreisberg wise guy answer? I'm waiting. I want to, I'm going to be sitting not only next to me, it's going to be people on both sides. <laughs> so on the left side, I want one of those people, you know, these kind of people, they always bring snacks to class. You know, they're always coming in and they got like snacks and cookies and stuff. No, like now you're that. kidding. You, know, you shouldn't be that, saying that. That's the person on the left side. And, and the person on the right side, do you know this other kind of person who takes great notes? Takes stenographic great notes. I'd like to be in the middle of the snack person and the note taker. <laughs> now, wouldn't that answer, answer hurt you? Yes, but yeah. I would go down, I would go down being true to myself. So you have to ask yourself, and I ask you this question, John, what is more important, being true to yourself or getting admitted to Harvard Business School? Oh boy, that's a deep ethical question. No, it's not. <laughs> Okay, you know, you know what we should be saying, being admitted to Harvard Business School. Yeah, you can be true to yourself after that. And it provides the platform of being a bigger self to be true to. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you can accomplish both. Maybe you can be true to yourself and, and you know, get into who, Harvard and, Business and School. And it'll, it'll help you find out who you are. You know, in order to be true to yourself, you need to find out who you are. And so going to Harvard Business School can help you do that. Right. So one quick observation, Sandy. Yes. It seems to me that uh, at numerous times you mentioned modules. And I wonder in preparing for the interview, should you be thinking that way? In other words, yeah. uh, yes. set even up. Though, set, even yeah. though that the questions I read from the actual interview 
that was that did follow modules. Real interviews yeah. sometimes are fragmentary. But in terms right. of preparation, you should prepare a college module because you're in college. That's what they've got to talk about. There is going to be this set of questions. Tell me about your college. What do you like about it? Why did you go there? What is your favorite course? What would you do differently? They got this cockamamie question. If you had 10 minutes to talk to the president of your college, what would you say? Assuming that the guy is looking for advice, you know, from high performing students. So you should prepare the whole college module. And then you should prepare the module about your work experiences. Why did you take that job? What was good about it? What was bad about it? What, what did you learn? What was the corporate culture like? Did you prefer your first job to your second job? What could you see yourself doing in the future? That, that's the way to prepare. Those are questions that are going to be asked. And while there can be right and wrong answers, isn't it truly more important that you're at ease and that you're just, you, you appear to be casual and informal in a way that's, that, that makes you come across as uh, honest and genuine? Yes, it's very hard to be. Very hard to yeah. be unscripted <laughs> and very yeah. hard to come across as being honest in general. Right. And do no harm. Okay. Do no harm. Leave following advice. Do no harm. Don't talk too much. Answer the question. Don't show off. You know, that'll do it. I also do mock interviews. If anyone is interested in paying to get professional preparation. And people do. Yes, they certainly do. How many uh, annual uh, mock interviews do you do for Harvard? A lot, including two plus two. Harvard interviews 1,900 people and accepts like 1,100. And then there's some attrition to get to a class of whatever it is, 945. Out of the 1,900 people they interview, I do mock interviews for 150. That's that, a pretty good sample size. That is a lot of mock interviews. That means, yeah, 150 people out of this universe of 1,900 people have found me, have contacted me, and have paid me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good sample size. I'm telling you, as soon as I get out of here, I'm calling up Rudy. And I'm telling him to employ you for his new yes. favorite client. That is true. <laughs> okay, John, thanks for having this. And I hope it's helpful for all you. Well, who, what schools do two plus two? What, what, do you know what schools have deferred programs? Harvard and Stanford. Well, what, but, and uh, Yale does as well. Right, Yale does. So, and, and, I, and I would imagine that the this same is kind good, of protocol yes, is good for everyone. Right. Yeah. Super. Okay. Well, Sandy, thanks again for all your great advice and for all of you out there who are about to walk into an interview at Harvard, at Yale, yeah. at Stanford for a deferred MBA admit program. Good we've luck. Got, you know, we've, there's a lot of free advice on the Poets and Quants website. We'll post some, John, post the links to the how not to blow your interview. That will do. Yeah. That, that's that helpful. applies to everybody. That applies to everybody. Yeah. Okay, folks. All right. Good luck. Good luck, everyone. Thanks for watching.